All right. So welcome to our webinars, the last of our series on community and fungi from the Cornell Small Farms Program and with our community mushroom educators. Uh, my name is Steve Gabriel. I'm one of the Cornell folks um, co-facilitating along with Yolanda Gonzalez. And we have our wonderful community Hello. educators that will um, introduce themselves briefly as they uh, jump into to sharing a bit. Um, the, Sorry, I'm going to mute somebody here just to keep it there. So, um, yeah, uh, really glad to have you all here. The, the goal of this is really to share out some of the things that we've been discussing and thinking about as a group. We've um, been gathering since um, since the pandemic, essentially, is when we kind of started getting together. Mostly it was online and have worked through a lot of different mushroom curriculum, talked about cultivation techniques and, and different elements to that, and also really talked about education and teaching and community and all, how those things all interconnect. Um, and so one of the reasons we want to bring this to the forefront is just to, to have some conversation and, and keep thinking about and determine as we move forward what kind of um, activities and collective action we might want to take um, to increase access, because that's really the point. I think I can speak for everyone where we're all like really excited and passionate about mushrooms and have found our own ways to relate to them and work with them and, and recognize that um, things we might have access to others don't in some cases or vice versa and that there's ways that we can all kind of collectively um, get folks on board who want to learn more and, and get their hands in into mycelium and into mushrooms so um, I'll just share a couple of resources um, our community mushroom educator project does have a website just community mushroom educators.org um, or you can find that through Cornell small farms programs mushroom website as well and right now we're actually in a bit of a um, internal uh, discussion about what it's going to look like moving forward. We had a uh, wonderful grant from Northeast Sarah as well as some support from USDA NIFA, um, uh, different agricultural funding sources to get this started. And now we're looking to the folks who have participated in this first round to have conversation and think about how, how it might look moving forward. So you can check out the website to learn more about the program and, and know that you can sort of stay tuned for what it's going to look like in, in 2022 as we, as we figure that out uh, as a collective. Um, and there's a, a sign up, a little email sign up on, at the bottom if you want to stay in touch and get notified of when we have an announcement about what that might look like um, and how you might be able to participate, then you can find that on that page as well. And the other page I'll mention is just overall overarching. Uh, this is this this page and project is embedded in sort of our overall mushroom cultivation project, um, which started really just focusing on research and learning about how to best cultivate mushrooms. Uh, we started with a lot of outdoor systems, and then we, we've been more recently looking at some indoor production uh, ideas. And along the way, we've met a lot of growers and people interested. We've learned a lot about markets and economics for those looking to sell. We've learned a lot about how mushrooms can fit into community, um, communities of all sorts of different sizes and shapes and colors, and um, and with all sorts of goals in mind. So, so uh, while we might have some economics and, and sales figures on this, that may not be everyone's goal and we totally recognize and, and honor and support that. But our website is sort of a repository of everything that, um, that we've been working on over the past like 10 or 15 years through the Cornell Mushroom Project, but also hopefully connecting you to a lot of the other amazing people out in the world doing stuff with mushrooms. So we have some resources to connect you to suppliers, to folks who can, um, Get you spawn and Morning. cultivation and we have um uh some links that it says coming soon here we're actually about to publish uh, a links a uh, page about books videos and podcasts that uh, a student is helping me work on that's now ready to go live but a lot of resources there outside of cornell as well that can help you link to the many possibilities with mushrooms so check that out at cornellmushrooms.org all right, so um, our uh, group here assembled and had some conversation and we're thinking about um, this question of increasing access to, to mushroom cultivation. And um, there are many different aspects to that. We're actually excited to have some conversation with you all about things you're thinking about or things you've experienced or seen around that. We focused on kind of three different um, areas for our conversation and for digging a bit deeper. So what we're gonna do is sort of pass pass the mic around a bit and share some examples um, from our experience of what seems to be some challenges and some opportunities when we think about uh, increasing the access to mushroom cultivation. So 
The first one um, I'll start with and share uh, a little bit about is, is just the feeling out there that the, there may be so many options to cultivation. Uh, there's many different materials you can grow mushrooms on. There's many different species. You could maybe grow indoors. You could maybe grow outdoors. People are in different climate regions in the world, which have an effect on mushrooms. Um, and there's a lot of uh, information out there. If you uh, have been searching around, I'm sure you found lots of different resources. Um, but they can sometimes overwhelm and make it feel like it's hard to know where to get started. And so Cecilia and I talked about some of the ways that we could um, shortcut or give some some starting points for folks to uh, to think about uh, things that they might find uh, material wise on hand or might um, already have around them, things that are low cost and things that can get you started with some of the skill building and, and relationship building really that I think it takes to, to learn how to grow mushrooms in the long term. So. Um, so we want to decrease the overwhelm feeling or just the, the blanket of information that can be out there and identify some techniques and practices that, that folks could do basically in their kitchen or their home or their backyard. Um, and we're thinking about ways we could maybe provide some of these examples like recipes that you could follow. So if you're learning to bake for the first time, you probably don't just throw a bunch of things in a pan and hope it works. You probably follow a recipe. And then uh, as you learn more, you can, you can experiment from there. So... Um, with that, I'm going to pass it to Cecilia to share about one example of a, a fun project you could do with mycelium. Um, thank you, Steve. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Cecilia. I'm a community mushroom educator with Cornell. And I'm an anthropologist, and I started researching um, more sustainable methods for food production. And this is how I got involved in the world of mushrooms um, and it's very exciting how diverse and extensive it is um, but like Steve mentioned it's also very overwhelming and one of the things that I in particular struggle with is lack of space. I live in New York City in a small apartment so that can be difficult sometimes to um, cultivate mushrooms. So we decided to um, share with you some recipes. The first one I'll share is mycelium shapes. And rather than thinking about the cultivation of mushrooms, here, sorry about that, what is some noise? <laughs> um, we're thinking about the cultivation of mycelium um, to turn it into an object. Um, in this case, uh, I made a planter with mycelium. And um, I can share a little bit about it. Um, I, one of my favorite mushrooms is lion's mane. And I wanted to originally make it out of this uh, mycelium. But lion's mane mycelium is very thin, very wispy, and it grows very slowly. So um, that wasn't the most appropriate strain um, and species to use. So the only materials that we need for a planter are the spawn and preferably a fast growing uh, strain. We also need a, a plastic container to act as the mold. Um, for this particular shape, I made it out of cardboard and then I lined it with plastic film so the mycelium wouldn't eat through it and to keep away other contaminants. And then for substrate, um, mushrooms can grow in many different types of materials, but when it comes to food production, people are usually more careful well, to source their materials just in case it has um, any unwanted, you know, chemicals that you may not want in your body. Um, but for this case, since we're not going to eat the shapes, uh, you can basically use anything you have laying around. I use things from my recycling bin, uh, particularly egg cartons. Um, and just like making a mycelium block that you want to fruit, I boil the substrate, I drained it, and then I fill the mold with um, the substrate and some of the spawn. 
uh, the more spawn you use, obviously the faster it'll be ready. Uh, this particular shape was meant to be a gift. So I need to be ready very quickly. So I use a lot of spawn. And then you carefully remove it from the mold and then you bake it at the lowest temperature. Or you can also dry it up under the sun for a few days. And um, this is a great activity that you can do, you know, with kids or with students um, that shows how mycelium grows. And, you know, it's a little bit separate from mushroom cultivation, but it's still part of it and shows the fungi life cycle. Awesome, thanks. Another um, example of something that you could do in your kitchen or a very small space um, is what I like to call sort of stovetop oyster cultivation. Um, so similar in some ways uh, to the last example, but focused more on the goal of producing fruiting mushrooms. Um, you could obtain uh, straw, shredded straw, or um, another common thing we've seen folks be able to find, especially in like pet stores, are um, wood chips that are or wood shavings that are used for bedding, like aspen shavings. You would want to use not uh, not like a pine shaving or anything like that, but a hardwood uh, or a tree, uh, shavings coming from a tree that has leaves, not needles, because the pine tends to um, not help the mycelium grow. So you could experiment with different things and you could imagine that something like straw, you may be able to, be able to find something in your garden or your backyard or, or down the block that you could harvest and dry and then shred up like straw. So it's really just something that's high in, um, in cellulose and things like that. The next thing you basically do is boil it on your stove like you would be cooking a, a, a meal. You boil it for 90 minutes, uh, and this is to clean the straw uh, and essentially remove any other contaminants, any other kind of microbes that might inhibit the growth of the oyster. And then you can spawn it with, um, again, spawn. And when we say spawn, what we mean is it's actually mycelium that you can either make yourself. We'll talk about some ways to do that in a bit or you can purchase from a supplier, just like you would buy seeds um, from a, a seed supplier for vegetables or something like that. And you're, you're putting that into the, mixing it into the material. Uh, so a couple examples here in the pictures, one is a, a sort of a straw log that we made. It's, it's cut in half to show how the mycelium is growing through, but we just stuffed that in a long sort of tubular bag um, to get it going. And then another example is at a youth farm that I did an activity at, we did this and we packed them just into Ziploc bags. And you can see here, the Ziploc bag is folded over. So it's about a third full and you pack it really tight with the straw and the mycelium mixed in, and then you leave it like that. Same kind of thing, the oyster tends to grow really fast. And in three to four weeks, you tend to see this kind of harder pillow, kind of white fluffy shape, at which point you can basically cut a slit um, in the material and see if those mushrooms pop right out. It sometimes can take a little bit of time and there's some ideal temperatures depending on when the, um, depending on where the oysters are, are fruiting. So in this case, these were both a blue oyster, which likes cool, cooler temperatures like 65 or 70 degrees Fahrenheit. But then there's a yellow oyster and there's a pink oyster and the pink oyster can handle much hotter temperatures. And so you could kind of pick the mushroom um, based on the temperature where you think you might be fruiting it. And so this is a really easy way to get started. If you didn't have access to a stove or even uh, a place to boil water, um, you can also do this uh, by soaking the straw in a bucket with um, something called hydrated lime, which is a little different than what you might be familiar with of like garden lime or agricultural lime. Hydrated lime is used most, mostly in like masonry type projects. So a place that supplies uh, masonry materials and you can get it for very inexpensive. Um, and you basically use that to um, you raise the pH of it by adding the lime to the water and soaking the straw overnight. But it basically does the same thing as boiling it without the energy or, or the need for a stove. And so in certain places, that might be a more appropriate way to do it. But it's a really easy way to get started. And then you can play with your recipe. You could change the type of material you use as your base, like in this case, the straw, to something else. You could add in um, coffee grounds or other nutrients to try to increase the productivity of them. You could change the size or the shape of the container. You could even play with things um, 
uh, that are more permanent containers like glass jars or buckets or things like that. So there's a lot of ways that we've seen people take this and experiment as a way to start growing and getting to know what's possible. Okay, another example here from Cecilia. Yeah, um, so mushroom cultivation and liquid culture. Uh, as we have seen before, uh, we can uh, use the five gallon buckets but for me, that's kind of inaccessible because of, like I mentioned, reduced spaces and the inability that I have where I live to control the temperature, to control the humidity, all of these things that affect uh, mushroom uh, cultivation. And so one solution that I came up with, uh, because I still wanted to learn, I still wanted to experiment with mushrooms, even though I didn't have the space or I couldn't source the materials like straw, for example, or the lime, um, was to learn more about liquid culture. Uh, the problem that a lot of people see with liquid culture is that they think they need a lab and this you know, includes very expensive equipment. Uh, like we see the HEPA filter, um, a nice all-American pressure, cooker and uh, hard to get materials like um, these lids with the rubber uh, uh, entry points. And also there's an abundance of recipes out there. So it's difficult to, to know which one's best, which one's gonna work for me. And if, should I really invest all this uh, time and resources on something that might not work out? So I decided to experiment and we can go to the next slide. Just, you know, working with liquid cultures using household items. My goal was to make a recipe as simple as possible, accessible and affordable for anyone, mostly using items that you can find in your kitchen. So the materials that I used were mason jars and lids. Uh, Micropore tape, which is just a breathable tape that you can find at any drugstore. You, you can also use, alternatively, polyester stuffing, and that is if you've ever opened up a pillow or a stuffed animal, uh, that's what's in there. Or if you're a little bit more adventurous, you can use high temperature silicone, which is pretty affordable and you can get it at any hardware store. Then to actually made the, to make the liquid nutrients, um, we can use uh, equal parts mixture of coconut water and filter water, or we can also use a 4% honey water solution. And what this means is that if you have 100 milliliters of water, you want to add four milliliters of honey. And you just have to do the math and use any measurement that you want, but just make sure that you don't go above that 4% of honey, because um, that could actually be toxic for the mycelium. Or if you use too little, it could not be, uh, maybe it's too little nutrients for the mycelium to grow. Then we just need a regular cooking pot and stove um, a needle and a syringe. And then we can either get a liquid culture syringe that you can buy from spawn vendors. Uh, they're pretty affordable. They're about $15 in most places. But if that's still a little bit inaccessible for you, you can just get a fresh mushroom for the supermarket or a mushroom that you foraged and experiment with that. And then the process of uh, doing this, first we have to make the lids. And you just uh, punch a hole through these metal lids and you cover them with a tape or you pass through a little bit of the polyester stuffing or you put a dab of the silicone on top and let it dry. Uh, next, we can do the nutrient solution you can choose either recipe, whatever's easier 
uh, at that moment. And then fill the jars and close them. Then we put the jars in a pot and we cover them with water, making sure that water doesn't get on top because if the tape or the polyester stuffing gets uh, wet, then we can allow contamination to go through. So we want to, uh, we want that to remain dry. And we heat up that pot for 30 minutes. It should start boiling at around 10 minutes. So we just leave it in total for 30 minutes and then we allow it to cool down. Um, and then we go to the next step, which is uh, sterilizing our needles. So this is easier if you're using a pre-made liquid culture syringe. You just uh, sterilize the needle and insert it into the jar and put in a little bit of the uh, liquid culture. But if you have a fresh mushroom, then you want to do a tissue sample. Uh, to do this, you should make sure that the area that you're working in is very clean. There's no drafts of air blowing, you know, things around, particularly spores that could be in the environment. Um, and with that uh, syringe that you have that's clean and sterile, we want to take a little bit of the liquid in the in the jars that we just prepared and then scrape a little bit of that mushroom from inside of it and then carefully insert it back into the jar and the force of the liquid going in will push the little piece of that mushroom into the jar and um, this method has worked for me and it's quite exciting because you're essentially cloning a mushroom with that little piece. And in just a few days, you can see little strands coming out and expanding. And that's the mycelium growing. And that will allow you to, you know, open so many possibilities uh, uh, with that liquid culture. You can inoculate you know grains and see if it works or you can expand it in another jar you can share it obviously sometimes we're going to experience contamination issues because we're not working in a lab so it's never going to be a hundred percent effective but it's still very um interesting to do and if we can go to the next slide, please. So the takeaways from this is that it's a great way to learn about cultivation if you don't have a lot of space or a lot of resources. And because it grows very quickly, you can see cultivation at its early stages. It's like I said, very fun experimenting with all these different methods and recipes. And then obviously you can make up your own as you go along. And lastly, it's affordable and accessible because you can use common household items. So it's a great project that you can share um, with the community, with students, with anyone who's interested in mushrooms. Okay, this is uh, me and Sneha's um, part. So, um, so in the past few years, I actually have been also experimenting with a lot of this low tech techniques that um, Steve and Cecilia was sharing. So thank you so much for sharing this um, techniques and affordable and accessible ways for people to experiment and learn to grow. And in, in the past, um, uh, I guess one and two years, I, I've been also interested in um, how to make it, how to introduce mushroom growing into uh, urban outdoor space. So um, we 
say here community gardens, but it doesn't have to be community gardens. It can be uh, school gardens, or it could be someone's backyard, um, or even like a, your balcony. Um, so yeah, can we go to the next slide? So there are a few challenges. Um, we both figured that we are constantly facing. Um, like uh, earlier, we talked about outdoor space is always very, very limited, very um, precious here um, in the city. Uh, I'm based in Queens in New York. Um, um, so thinking about like, if we only have this little amount of space outdoor, how can we best utilize the space? Um, another challenge we figured is like, it's always hard to source the right substrates uh, in the city. Um, Cause uh, of course you can buy, um, but we also want to think about like ways we can maybe, you know, talking about accessibility is like affordable, easy to um, access. Um, like thinking about what kind of materials or substrates we can use in the city. And even like for me personally, sometimes I figure, oh, I actually found a really good source for um, getting the substrate. But I only have this little space. I cannot store um, the bulk substrates or have um, a lot of space to properly treat my substrate. So I have to think about like, what are some of the, um, um, ty what types of substrates can allow me and uh, still experiment, do my experimentation, but at the same time, I don't always make a mess because that would be discour dis uh, discouraging too um, for me. And also another challenge we figured is, um, oftentimes it's, it's costly to access fresh and high quality spawn. And for, it, especially if you are just um, get started, uh, maybe the, the project scale is small. Um, oftentimes I, I only use like maybe 10% of the, the spawn bag and then leave the rest in the, in the fridge. It would, it would be ideal if we already have a, like a community to share, that would be, I think, ideal situation. But what if I, I just started and I am using a little bit of the spawn and paying like $30 for a big bag and you know using a little bit and yeah, it's a cost adding on top of everything. Um, so, and on the other side, living in the urban environments, we figured, you know, we are having a lot of waste streams around us. One is the from the tree services, uh, services. Um, so, um, um, like, where where do those um, um, logs or um, you know tree waste coming from the tree services? Um, so that's one, and another is. Uh, urban small community farmers also are facing the similar situation that we individual um, growers are facing. They have limited space. So oftentimes what they do is they grow their, they fruit their mushrooms. Um, after one harvest, they have to move very quickly so, so that they can always maximize the um, productivity. Um, so oftentimes they harvest once from the grow bags, and then they have to move those out of their way and get new batch of grow bags in their space to, um, for, um, for fruiting. So um, oftentimes we can, um, if you know where their dumpsters are, <laughs> you can find um, spent blocks um, that are uh, discarded by the small, um, farmers here, or often, or more often, it's like you can talk to the um, um, farms and and talk to them and say if you can utilize some of their spent blocks because there are 
there's a, actually a lot of productivity left in those bags. So that's a waste, but for them, but for us could be a, a, a big resource. Another um, waste stream is, as Cecilia mentioned earlier, um, the cardboard. We receive a lot of, we have a lot of cardboards here, like just from shopping or yeah, me, mainly shopping, I guess, um, packaging. So yeah, thinking about all these challenges, challenges we're facing, um, can you clip, click once? So for those challenges, I, yeah, we wonder, can we be a little bit creative? And I have to say, I think whenever we are faced with challenges, we automatically <laughs> have to or become creative. So yes, there are ways to be creative and people are doing this. Um, so questions are like, because our space is limited, can we, what are some of the interesting ways we can um, um, increase the utility of our space? Um, because the, we don't have space to treat or store our substrates, can we think of or find the type of substrate that can allow us to grow without a lot of you know, a long or complicated process. And because of the cost to access fresh and high quality spawn, are there ways for us to make our own spawn? Liquid culture is one way to um, clone and make spawn out of very um, accessible materials. What are other ways? Um, click please. And then from the waste streams, the, the waste, someone's waste, could, could those be our opportunities? Um, so one thing in the city is we have a lot of street trees and I'm in Queens, I'm in Ridgewood and I don't have a lot of parks near me, but we have a lot of cemeteries <laughs> um, here. So one, one place to source wood chips is actually cemetery. Um, so, that um, I've got wood chips from cemetery, it's free. You just need to get trash bags and then haul back haul, haul, however um, uh, quantity you need and then soak the, the wood chips and then you can use that as your material. Um, the, the spent blocks from the, the farms, we talked about this earlier. Um, so those are things we can grab and grow. Um, and the cardboard is another resource we can think about like how to utilize for, for growing. And we will, like next we are, we're gonna share with you some examples. Um, next, please. So here are some examples of using mostly um, um, cardboard, wood chips, um, to grow in the limited in limited space. Um, <clears throat> so first um, uh, example is mulch with mulch uh, mushroom patch. So in the garden we have this <clears throat> need to create a, a path, walkable path <clears throat> between the vegetable um, growing growing sections. So one way you can do this is um, get some cardboards, soak the cardboard, soak your wood chips, and then do the lasagna method, one layer of uh, wood chips, one layer of um, spawn, and then just leave, leave it that way, keep it moist. And then um, that's a mushroom patch that you are creating. Um, another way is thinking about basically wherever you want to uh, mulch, you can think about like using the material that can also be uh, used for growing mushrooms. So combining um, uh, the need to mulch and the desire to grow some mushrooms. So uh, multi, basically multi use, um, take advantage of the possibility of multi-using the space. And then you can also grow uh, mushrooms uh, alongside your vegetables. 
here are two in the middle, two examples. One is growing in, um, uh, this is wine caps with uh, garlic, right? This photo is from Yolanda. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the, the middle bottom one is with asparagus, also uh, wine caps. So again, it's um, combining mulch and um, growing vegetables. And this is, um, this would especially be um, beneficial for or, or helpful in the situation where you want to do like a no-till uh, growing, and especially if you are growing um, like cranials, like asparagus, because you don't want to, for mushrooms, uh, for fungi, you don't, they don't like to be disturbed all the time. So if it's like a perennial uh, no-till garden, that's, um, that would be very, something interesting for you to consider. Um, and again, if you don't really have any, uh, you, don't, you don't know where to access uh, wood chips. You don't have a space to soak the wood chips, um, but you happen to be uh, nearby a mushroom farm or you know um, where there is a farm nearby you or in your area. Uh, one thing is talk to them, get some spent blocks and just bury it. And you don't need to do like the, the work would be very minimal. So here are two examples. Basically what we did was uh, having, it's not in the ground, but you can do that too. Um, so here the examples are, um, they say you have uh, um, planters, uh, just regular planters and regular soil and um, dig a hole, uh, remove the plastic uh, wrap from the span block and then bury your block and cover and mulch. Um, here we just use straw or you know um, guard yard some yard waste or whatever you use um, for mulch. You can just do it and then keep it again. You can water it and uh, just keep it uh, moist and um, and then you get mushrooms. Um, it's really um, low in last in terms of um, money and time and yeah, and it's a good way to just learn, like if all this can be a good way for you to just get a, get your learning experience and uh, in terms of how to grow mushrooms and, and at the end have some mushrooms. So, um, okay, I am gonna pass it over to my friend to talk about, uh, cardboard spawn because we think we talked about you know um it's oftentimes um costly to access spawn but it's just it feels great if you can create something from minimum and and here we are thank you jj um so my name is sneha i'm also a community mushroom educator and today I'm gonna to walk you through the steps of making your own cardboard spawn using store-bought mushrooms. Um, again, when JJ and I were coming up with these, uh, we were thinking about um, people uh, growing mushrooms in an urban environment. So with limited space and limited resources. Um, so this is probably a, uh, an exercise or a project that's really useful and can be applied to um, all of the um, uh, projects that you've heard of so far. Um, so I'm going to walk you through the steps and then the next slide I have a couple more pictures to kind of illustrate for you how um, cardboard spawn works. So what you need to acquire is cardboard. Um, and uh, a great way you could do that is maybe recycle your cardboard waste from all the boxes, from all the ordering that you do. Um, if you live in New York, there's no shortage of cardboard boxes on the street. Um, and you want to collect cardboard boxes that don't have too much um, ink on them. Um, or at least that's my recommendation if you're planning to eat the mushrooms, um, being that if they are uh, toxic chemicals, they will be accumulated into the mushrooms and that would not be healthy. 
So um, clean or cardboard uh, boxes or waste. Um, next, you need a, a Tupperware. Um, and then you need a drill with a drill bit to make some holes in that Tupperware. And then mushrooms, which you can actually acquire from the store. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about oyster mushrooms only because they are very tenacious and easy to grow. Uh, but you can also try your hand at shiitake mushrooms or lion's mane mushrooms to um, mushrooms that are growing more and more common at the store. And um, you could try to clone agaricus uh, or portobello or button mushrooms, but they're um, actually manure loving mushrooms. So it might be easier for you to start with the oyster mushrooms for those of you who haven't grown mushrooms before. And then um, hot water, uh, which I'll explain in a second. So uh, I took the steps and I separated them into prep and then um, the, the making part of the um, spawn and then the inc incubation portion. So for prep, a couple things you need to do. Um, I like to pasteurize my cardboard, which means soaking them in hot water or close to boiling water. Um, it helps to remove any dirt if the cardboard was, you know, sitting somewhere and it was dirty or had some residue from some glue or some tape. Um, it also adds moisture to the substrate and it also helps break down um, the substrate walls so that the mushroom mycelium can more easily um, myceliate the substrate, so the cardboard. Then once you have um, wetted and cleaned this cardboard, you can actually take the cardboard sheets apart. So you might have noticed in cardboard, you have sort of like two layers with a squiggly layer in the mi middle. Um, so if you're using corrugated cardboard, which I really like to use for cardboard spawn, uh, because it creates sort of these channels for air to, to pass through. Um, and then basically you take the larger cardboard sheet and you cut it into strips that are small enough to fit inside your Tupperware container. Um, another thing that you want to do before you start building your cardboard spawn, spawn box is take your Tupperware and with a drill bit, um, just distribute small holes throughout the body of the Tupperware container. Um, I usually don't poke holes at the top or the bottom. Again, the holes are there so that the mushroom uh, mycelium can breathe and there's fresh air exchange as the spawn is growing inside. Um, so once you have these things prepped, I have this very quick doodle on the left hand corner of what your Tupperware box uh, prepped with holes might look like. Um, then what you wanna do is take your uh, cardboard strips and uh, just like JJ had uh, mentioned about uh, using a lasagna style to make a garden bed, we're doing the same here. Um, there are a couple other methods which I'll show you in the next slide. Um, you could also uh, roll, um, sorry. Uh, so we can take the cardboard layers and then um, between each cardboard layer, you're gonna take bits of the clean mushroom tissue uh, from your store-bought mushrooms. You want to rip into the stem of the mushroom and where you see clean tissue, you want to select that part and go ahead and layer it in between your cardboard pieces. Um, and then you want to close the, the, the cardboard spawn Tupperware um, Thing and you want to leave it in a cool, dark place. And in about two weeks, you should be able to um, see some spawn or mycelium growth inside. Um, so quickly, next. Yeah, on the left, um, so just have cardboard. You can see at the top corrugated sheets. You could also see the cardboard shredded. And then you could also attempt what they call like a, like a more of like a roll or a burrito style 
um, uh, cardboard spawn method. Um, so you prep the cardboard, you soak it, you take, a, you take apart the corrugated sheets, um, and then you go ahead and you select the clean tissue culture from inside the mushrooms, break um, the smaller bits, and you want to, in a lasagna style, uh, build the mushroom and cardboard in layers. Um, and that's essentially it. So the reason we're showing you this is once you have spawn, you can use this for your liquid culture experiment. You could even go ahead and take these, this cardboard and bury it or use it as spawn for your garden bed. Um, uh, it, it's a really, really cheap, easy, accessible way to create spawn and, and do um, whatever that you wish. Great. Thanks, Neha. So um, Amanda, Yolanda, and I are going to talk a little bit about a theme that you've heard through the first few um, groups, which is this notion of sourcing substrates. Um, so on the next slide. So what we did was, you know, really think about all the variables. And I think one of the key variables that you've heard also through what people have been talking about is space. Um, and that's often, you know, very limited when you're talking about an urban setting, but um, we've got people living all over. And I think there's often different challenges based on different environments that you're living in. So while, you know, substrates may not be directly accessible um, in an urban environment, as JJ mentioned, there's creative ways of, of sourcing some of those and in, in different capacities. But even within a rural environment, and that's where I'm based. So um, I'm a community mushroom educator based out of Orange County in the, the Hudson, lower Hudson Valley. Um, I have a, a three and a half acre farm. I have my own woods. Um, but I get questions from a lot of people that I work with just in terms of, well, I, I live here in Orange County or I live upstate and I, I'm still having a problem getting these materials. So we really thought about how to articulate that issue in terms of really in both, you know, across the board in terms of urban and rural environments, reliable sourcing. And when we talk about reliable, um, we use that word in a couple of different ways. Um, one, and this also came up as a theme in what people have talked about is um, you wanna make sure it's clean. You wanna make sure is it, you know, who, who is this coming from? What have they done with it? What is, has it been exposed to, you know, sort of the, the sourcing and, and the cleanliness of that substrate is very important um, at a baseline. But then also if you're doing this as a business, right? Say you want to sell to restaurants or you want a reliable supply of mushrooms for your family, you know, all year round or whatever, you know, how do you make sure it's consistent? Um, and it's not sporadic, you know, so reliable is a, in a couple of different ways. And then we're talking not just about, you know, logs, but other substrates as well. So they kind of, they've got different but related issues. So logs is one category, but then other substrates you've heard in the, the, the previous um, groups, you know, talking about straw and wood chips and then alternate materials, which Amanda will be talking to you a little bit about there are unique time and location dependent access challenges. And by time, we're also talking, you know, weather dependent. For example, for logs, you, there's a really small window I and mean, you could be, you know, cutting trees all year round. The best time to be doing it is in the colder months where you have less chances of contamination. So that window to really get your best logs and then to inoculate them, which is in that few months after, because you need fresh logs in order to, to do uh, uh, an inoculation. There, there are those, you know, time. And then, as I mentioned, location dependent access challenge. So when we were thinking about all of this, what really struck us was this notion of where we identified and we'll walk you through some of the, these, you know, challenges that we've articulated. What these all sort of laddered up to were these bigger issues of network, and knowledge. And network, again, everything has multiple meanings here. Um, 
and and it all relates back to the mushroom network, the mycelium. Um, but when you talk about network, right? I mean, so we we've made some great strides um, in terms of um, of supplier maps, right? Um, if you go on the Cornell Small Farm site, and you can find different suppliers for logs, especially. Contacts is one thing, right? You can you can know who to reach out to, but if you don't have an established relationship or you don't know how to talk to that person, or maybe you're just starting out, you don't quite exactly know what you need. Also, there is some, there is sort of a, a gap, you know, in terms of, well, here's the list of people and who's closest to me and who can I, you know, cold call, but what am I saying when I reach out to them? Are they even going to know what I'm talking about? You know, who grows mushrooms? You know, are, are, are loggers even aware that people are doing this? There's all these sort of gaps, right? And that's what we're talking about in terms of supplier relationships. Um, if you've got your own woods, or maybe you've got some friends who've got woods, even if you live in the city, you know, people outside who, who have access to woods, you know, when I mentioned that you're going to be ideally and optimally cutting these, you know, trees and, and, and obtaining these bolts in the cold season, you need to make sure you know what trees you're cutting down because certain species, certain, you know, uh, of, of mushrooms grow best on certain species of trees. If you don't know tree species identification, if you don't know without the leaves, what sugar maple looks like, what red oak looks like, what white oak looks like, that's a gap. Um, and we want to make sure we're addressing that. Um, again, not everyone has access to a chainsaw or knows how to use a chainsaw. There's going to be a, a women's chainsaw class coming up on October 1st, I believe. So we can send you more information on that if you're interested. Um, game of logging is a, is a really great class to take. Um, and, and so tree felling practices, right? If you're interested in doing this and you want to do it on your own, how do you cut down a tree? Um, that's a gap. Transportation options. We already talked about this a little bit and, and Steve and, and Amanda and the team have done some really exciting work in terms of getting logs from upstate, making those contacts you know, with loggers upstate and getting them down into the city. Um, but transportation options, I think there's you know, people you know, coming up with all sorts of you know, inventive ways to get logs, which are quite heavy and big <laughs> you know, onto your property. Um, and then even things like supplier compensation. Um, you know, I work with a logger here that I've cold called um, and just kind of reached out and and started a, a conversation. And, you know, you can have um, general ideas around, um, well, a, a bolt, you know, uh, of around 36 inches and, uh, you know, uh, four to six inches in diameter could range anywhere from a dollar to three dollars per bolt you know, um, noting if it's in, in proper condition, the bark is intact, it's clean, there's no cuts in it um, that could compromise its integrity or cause contamination. Um, but is, is money the only way to compensate the supplier? Is it going to be worth the one to $3? Maybe you can come up with a creative way of compensating. Maybe it's a barter situation. So we wanted to just sort of lay all these out and thinking about this much larger. So where we're, we're coming at it from is, something that touches, you know, and everything that we already heard about from the other groups in terms of this sort of larger picture issue of access to substrates. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Amanda, um, who's gonna talk to you a little bit about other substrates. I kind of focus a little bit more on logs. So Amanda's gonna to talk to you about sort of the, the wider world and, and creative uh, sourcing of substrates. Thank you. Um... So I actually got into mushroom cultivation by sourcing substrates without realizing I was going to be growing mushrooms on them. Um, I'm an artist and I, you know, enjoy, there's something like really thrilling to me about like sourcing abundance of materials that, you know, are just being thrown out. And also it was an act of wanting to reuse something that was just in abundance going into the landfill. And so then I learned, oh, I can grow mushrooms on these materials. And so I, I've been working with oyster mushrooms pretty much, uh, mostly, uh, I, I feel like a connection to oyster mushrooms. And it's also a very, um, a very vigorous mushroom. So you can, um, it kind of grows really quickly on many different substrates so that, and, and almost like 
we've tried so many things um, on what to grow them on, and they really just kind of take to everything. I think someone's mic is um, uh, Warren Blue. I think you're unmuted. I mean, you're, yeah. Um, but so most people live near a coffee ground, a coffee shop, uh, and, or a brewery. And so you could actually, uh, people, you know, you could call ahead and you could get, uh, coffee grounds or, or beer grains from these shops. And so coffee grounds are also something you as, you know, just if you're a coffee drinker, you can save them, um, in a, in a container and freeze them intermittently, um, and save them yourself. So it's a really accessible way to grow mushrooms, but most coffee shops have like a busier time of day, time of the week. So you could call ahead, you could drop off the container and just ask them, you know, cause you don't want them like sitting around for a long time. So, so for example, the coffee shop where I get my coffee grounds from, they're really busy Thursday through Saturday. So I'll drop it off on Thursday, pick it up on Saturday, and then I'll either freeze the grounds or I'll inoculate, you know, as soon as possible. And so the same thing with uh, the brewery grounds, um, I found that you want to dry them out a little bit more than the coffee grounds. You want to, because usually they came really wet for some reason, they were like, you know, kind of soaked. So those are two options of how you could easily find, um, uh, materials that you can grow mushrooms on uh, just right in your local neighborhood. And other options are many restaurants and stores have a lot of cardboard as everyone's talked about, uh, but you can go, I, I actually, you know, I try not to order a lot of stuff online. So I actually go to local stores and say, I say, hey, and I do order stuff online, but you know, um, if I wanted to do an, a bigger inoculation with cardboard, I'll go to this uh, a store that, you know, they usually get things shipped to them so you can utilize their cardboard and people are usually very excited to give that away. And the same with five, uh, food grade five gallon buckets. So most restaurants are getting all these materials in bulk in food grade buckets. So I now have a, a a five gallon bucket source where, you know, I know that they have these buckets and I live in a really small apartment. So I actually can stack the buckets on top of each other as like totem pole kind of things. Um, and can grow mushrooms out of them, out of the, out of the bucket. And so, um, I've also been a part of a collaborative project called the mushroom shed. And we have put together some videos where people can, um, follow the instructions and the videos to actually grow using these materials uh, in a bucket. So it's we're trying to make it as easily accessible as possible for people. Um, and so you can, if you wanted to, you can watch the video and follow it along exactly on how to do it. Um, but that brings us to our next slide, which is. Um, opportunities. So two opportunities that we identified were to update. So Cornell has a buying and selling guide that uh, you know, we can, uh, you'll want to, we'll talk a little bit more about, but we talked about updating that and then also creating a network of regional mycelium matchmakers. So that would basically be a, lo a location specific person um, or a team of people that connects. So that's a person that is designated when you call them and you say, hey, I'm trying to find some wood chips, where can I find them? And they say, oh, okay, I can match up with this person. Um, so it's, a, it's, like a, it's like a hub where this person uh, is, you know, connecting people to uh, local supply chains where they can find their materials. Um, and Yolanda, I don't know if you wanna talk a little bit more about um, the guide, and then I'm sure, Aisha, I know that you have some more to add about mycelium matchmakers. Yeah, so, um... Like Amanda just mentioned, uh, I put the link in the chat box, but this buying and selling guide um, for, for logs. So essentially we're looking at improving this. And we mentioned before that tree ID is really important. So perhaps having different um, images of what different species look like that work really well and are suitable for mushroom production. Um, and, and then creating different guides for different substrates and having um, expanding it to also include urban ag considerations. So if you're in a city, these are substrates that are easier to obtain compared to if you're in a more rural area. 
Um, so just taking a look at what we have available and expanding it and making it as relevant as possible for all audiences. Yep, and so if we go back to that theme that we had of network and knowledge, right? The, the guide is really one way that we're thinking about of making sure that people have the right knowledge um, and can be informed to source substrate appropriately for what they wanna achieve and accomplish. And the mycelium matchmakers, which is our cute little name of kind of like a mushroom substrate dating service <laughs> is to um, basically, you know, get that network, those relationships. And like Amanda mentioned, you know, take advantage of the relationships, the supplier networks that people already have, so that anyone starting out doesn't feel, like Steve said at the very beginning, daunted by this task of like, well, who, how do I just go and find logs? Like, I don't, I don't know how to do that. We've got, we want to put people in place to help you do that. And we're really interested to learn what you think and get your ideas in terms of how to also improve on the knowledge and the network. And these are just a couple of the ideas that we put forward, but we're really looking forward to spending time discussing more and better ideas with all of you. Next slide. 